We're back. So a continuation of the story, your story, and where <laughs> we left off was Chantel had just moved to Guam and starting to experience life and reconnecting with her father. Yeah, that was an interesting season. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell me about it. So I think it had already talked about how I took my surfboard and that was a, a mistake. You know, it was kind of like, you know, the, my comfort, like my little blanket that was going to be my comfort. And um, actually it didn't, you know, work out that way, but <laughs> um, yeah. Guam was amazing. It was an amazing um, time experience island. Um I love adventure, so it was cool for me to experience both, you know, the culture of, of Guam. So for those of you who don't know, Guam is an island in the Micronesian Islands um, in the South Pacific. So not the Samoas or the Pacific Islands, but it's its own cluster of islands. Um, incredible diving and all of the things. So my dad had his sailboat moored. Um, in a, again, a go boat basin, he had electricity running to the boat and, um, it was like $6 a month. So he worked, uh, as a dental technician at a dental office there. Um, cause that's what he had done, you know, as a career growing up. And so he was able to, you know, work and save a lot of money there. Again, his bills were $6 a month. So, <laughs> uh why were they only six dollars you guys lived on the boat too yeah oh, okay we lived on the boat yeah so and he had electricity running he paid six dollars for the electricity wow yeah. and you also had a job too right yeah First so job there <laughs> uh a little bit about the boat 27 foot sailboat <laughs> um so the first part you know is the main cabin then there's a little cockpit and then there was this extra little part which basically, if you think about a sleeping bag, it was like a sleeping bag worth of room on each side that went under the cockpit. And that was my room. That was my, <laughs> that was my space. And um, we used a bucket. For your toilet. <laughs> for our toilet. <laughs> yeah. So it had a rope tied to it. So we would, you know, hang it over the side of the boat, collect some water, use the restroom in it, and then dump it back over that Interesting. was what we did <laughs> my shower was with a hose oh we had water running to it too so he had a hose so it was yeah, gotcha. water and electricity so he used a hose for the shower had to like shave my legs and everything <laughs> with cold water that's all we had um so you know even though it's a hot climate like you still get goosebumps so that sucked um in the boat uh Guam there's you know it's it's a tropical island so there was lots of mosquitoes and so you know you're in this little cabin and I had this net that would protect me from the mosquitoes but then you wouldn't get any airflow so it was always this catch-22 whether I wanted airflow or mosquito bites um, so that was fun also again in the previous video uh, I mentioned that my dad lived there with his mistress um, her uh, who is now his wife <laughs> and I love her. So disclaimer, now I didn't then, I was very angry then and it was a very difficult season in that sense. Yeah. Um, but that was my heart and intention was to go there for the purpose of working through this stuff. You know, all of the anger that I felt, I was on a mission to forgive, to understand, to ask the hard questions and um, really kind of find some resolve before I entered my adulthood because I was literally like 18 years old. So it was the time I was 18 to 19 that I lived there. Um, so initially I got a job at the dental office oh, okay. with him. Um, I worked in the front office with some cute little Filipino girls okay. and um it was it was pretty short-lived because I didn't love the job <laughs> and I didn't love working with my dad so uh, I quickly got a job at a surf shop and um so that was awesome I really enjoyed that 
Yeah. So now you're working in the surf shop. What was that like? And you were working in the surf shop and you were living in it, right? You had the opportunity to live there. Well, so you, right? initially, you know, so I spent a couple months, you know, actually it was six months that I spent on the boat, probably two or three of them I spent working at the dental office. And then the, the next two was working at the surf shop. And then eventually I was able to move into the surf shop. So at like six months mark, I moved into the surf shop because we had an office, um, threw a futon in there, had a meal mini <laughs> fridge. And so I would work 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. close, um, party till two, <laughs> go out drinking with friends that I met or employees or whatever. Um, clients, right? Do you, would you take clients out sometimes? No, I didn't take clients out. Oh, I mean, I would just go out with friends. Gotcha. But um, so the surf shop was a, a was an interesting dynamic because I, you know, started managing the surf shop. Okay. And um, I did have a couple of employees uh, that, and then the owner spent time both in Guam and in Hawaii. There was two stores, and um, so in a surf shop, you know, doing helping to do the buying for the shop too. Um, the sales reps would come over from Hawaii and that is who I took oh, okay. out. Um, gotcha. it was, uh, not a lot to do <laughs> on the Island. And so a lot of times I would take them to strip clubs and that was like entertainment. Um, you know, we had a lot of Japanese, uh, customers, which, you know, coming from Japan is only a two hour flight. So they could buy a lot of American goods. So they would come over and spend a lot of money because it was <laughs> like a portion of what it would cost them in Japan. So I also uh, built a relationship with the, the local tattoo shop. And so I would take the Japanese customers to the tattoo shop and get a little bit of a commission there. So I was a little bit of a hustler. Yeah, I guess um, so. sounds like it. And, um, you know, I did make a couple of friends and so, you know, that I worked with and whatnot, but, um, for the most part, I was on my own and it's a military Island. There's a, there's a, um, a military base there. And so that was the question, you know, being the only white girl, they were like automatically assumed that I was military. Like it was just weird to see a white girl on the Island that wasn't, Yeah. you know what I mean? So and how long um, were you there overall? On a, the year. Island? a year. A year. Mm -hmm. And so, what did you feel like you accomplished while you're there? Obviously, we can tell in work world, you became manager of that business and stuff and hustled. But what about what well, you were there for your dad? So, what do you think? How did that go? Did you feel like you had some breakthrough or some freedom come from that? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, I definitely felt that. And I, I, um, it was a much needed connection um time with him and and it was hard at the same time you know again because i was getting to know his now wife and you know still feeling a little bit of that like bitterness and resentment in a way um i also deeply missed my california beach break and surfing <laughs> so that sucked uh, I was really, really close to my two nieces at the time, um, Michelle's daughters, and they would send me, this was, I'm dating myself now, but they would send me fax. You remember the, the age of fax, the fax machine? <laughs> they would send me these long fax. I mean, like they would stack up to like this. It was like the most precious thing ever. Like pictures? And they would draw letters. me pictures and write me letters. Cool. And I mean... That's cool. I missed them so much. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So then what happened after Guam? So you were there a year. Yeah. So. Decided to go back home to Cali. Well, if you and I have ever even talked about this part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're all going to learn something new. All right. <laughs> oh, maybe we did. You're going to talk about the guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The guy, the, the boyfriend from the surf shop. Now the, I remember. The owner of the surf yep. shop who was much older than me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he and I ended up, uh, in a relationship. Um, yeah, I had lots of adventures, you know, uh, 
because I started doing helping with the buying and stuff for the for, for the surf shop. He and I ended up going over to Indonesia to Bali to buy jewelry and wood. And um yeah, it was a uh, it was an interesting season. And from there, my dad and I actually did a trip to Germany as well. Oh, okay. In the midst of that. But on my way home from Germany, I stopped in California for a quick little stint and um I surfed one of my one of my girlfriend's brand new surf shop uh surfboards and I <laughs> fell in love with like the shape and all of the things so when I went back to Guam I ordered that same thing because I knew I was going to go home soon yeah. I was I was nearing my like I was I was just getting done I was done with like the lifestyle I was done with I was burnt out from partying I was yeah. burnt out from working 10 a.m. <laughs> to 10 p.m. And I didn't feel like I was progressing anymore with my dad. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was just done. I was ready to be home. Back Is there home. anything significant that happened when you're in Germany? Was it just you and your dad? It was, it was just me and my dad. Um, anything significant? Well, I mean, it was interesting because I think my dad really wanted me to stay longer in Germany. He wanted to kind of tote me around to all of the family and nice. friends and and I was anxious to get back I had you know responsibilities that I was you know just he was kind of showing you where you came from essentially wanted well, to show you around it, and stuff it it didn't feel like that <laughs> show you off maybe yeah <laughs> I think it was the baby more girl of, the beautiful baby girl <laughs> I think it was more of him wanting to show off and maybe prove to people that he still had a relationship because he sure. had now chosen to move on yeah. from the family. So I, I feel like that's more of what it was. And so I was kind of just like, yeah, I'm ready to go. And so there was a little bit of a, he was upset about that. He felt like I threw the trip away, <laughs> essentially. You know what I mean? So, yeah. All right. Well, so now back to home. now back to the States. And were you still in the relationship with yeah. you? Okay. So it went on for a little bit longer. So then I went home and uh he decided to come along for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> so it was interesting because um I to be honest with you, there's so much that I like blocked out. Like I don't even remember what the plan was. I just remember being back in California and he couldn't handle being in my world. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he was good with me in his world over there, gotcha. but couldn't maintain. And so it, it dissipated real quick, which, you know, rightly so. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So then you started working where? So then I got a job at Costco. Costco at that time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. I got a job at Costco. And How did I... you meet Mateo's dad? Well, is that still a little ways down or? Yeah. So, right? so I got a job at Costco. I bought my cousin's volkswagen bug um and then at the time michelle started working at a spin gym in okay. escondido and so then i also got a job at the spin gym um you know doing the front desk stuff and so, so you had two jobs yeah. doesn't shock me doesn't surprise me she's <laughs> always had two or three jobs <laughs> yeah so i would go from costco then i'd go to the the training club and so and then I was back on my uh, beach break surfing. I had my custom board, which I loved that board. It was the best board on the planet. And so then I, you know, started doing the spin class too. And I just, I loved how I felt. I was light on my feet. I got better at surfing than I had before. I was just, I was really happy in that season. Like, um, and then um, I had met, a girl at Costco that I worked with. And then, you know, she had a couple of roommates and one of the roommates wasn't working out. And so they wanted to get another roommate. And so we all moved in together. Uh, it was interesting dynamic because we had an Italian, a Jew, and then me, I'm German. So it made, it made yeah. for some fun conflict, <laughs> but we're still friends. So that's good. Of course. doesn't surprise me either. <laughs> <laughs> I've met some of our friends from way back then, for sure. Long time friends. Okay, so um, now you're in California. You got these two jobs. 
what's next? Like, where did you, uh, uh, <laughs> what age did you actually meet Mateo's dad? Like, is that the next step here? So I met Herb. Um, Herb. I was, yeah, I, right on 20. So it was around that time we had moved uh, the, the, the couple of girls and I, my first roommate situation, um, we moved to Meyer Street, Oceanside, and um, I lived on that street a, a couple of different times. <laughs> but we had this cute little house that was old and cheap and I remember when I moved into that house my mom driving away and she tells me later that she actually cried <laughs> driving away from that that place because it was in the ghetto like it just yeah. was a ghetto place it was a little like dumpy surf place we actually um we actually had to like file something because we had mold in the wall they had to come fix it and wow. all those things so yeah it was it was it was a little hole but <laughs> <laughs> we loved it and so that's and when your place right yeah so that's yeah. when was this um, your own finally or did you have a roommate at this one that's what i'm talking about with this oh that was at the beach house yeah oh okay i didn't realize that gotcha i caught you now yeah some of the stories i missed <laughs> so then um we uh you know we went out one night and we were at a reggae we, we we went to like a local restaurant and there was a reggae band and and that's where i met um herb okay so herb and i dated for i don't know almost a year and it was it that's kind of like you know where the transition is we had you know the three roommates but then we all ended up with boyfriends who would also stay at the place. It was just kind of, it was crowded. a two bedroom. <laughs> it was a two bedroom. One of us slept in the living room. We we would rotate out who had the room and who would sleep in. The, it was just, you know, it's what you do when you're young and you're adulting. And so, <laughs> you know, eventually Herb and I then moved into an apartment. We had a roommate, a male roommate at the time, which I loved, by the way so much easier to live with men than <laughs> I will tell you <laughs> so I loved that so that's when Herb and I lived together and um then I had quit Costco and got a job at another surf shop in Oceanside okay so I was working at a surf shop I think I had even quit training club at that point so I was working at a surf shop full time it was a couple it was a little like mom and pop surf shop that um I worked at and um I lived in Vista and that's when I got pregnant with Mateo gotcha. yeah it was the craziest thing because the surf shop was right next to a donut shop and a taco shop okay. and so the smells <laughs> I was like Oh man, that was rough. Um, but at the same time, those owners decided to open up another shop in Del Mar. So I helped them open up that shop in Del Mar. So I worked a lot while I was pregnant. Um, and how old were you when I was you had 20. Mateo? When I was 21 when I had Mateo. Okay. So um, yeah, I worked a lot while I was pregnant because we were opening up that other shop. And mm -hmm. um, so then, um, it, the, okay, so <laughs> Herb was a skateboarder. He was a very handsome, tall skateboarder. And uh, I did not realize when we met and began our relationship, um, the depths of what his trauma was. So when he graduated high school, he was what, 18, 19. He was shot in the head. Hmm. And wow. so um, it was it was right, you know, up Where's here as far as the frontal lobe. And literally a piece of his brain is missing. And so, you know, I didn't understand what the repercussions of that were. At that time, I was young, mm -hmm. you know, uh so but after i got pregnant it was very clear that i was growing in maturity leaps and bounds yeah and he was not 
-hmm. And I battled with that because I was like, I just felt this overwhelming sense of like insecurity and, you know, there was just like a lot of things that showed themselves to me. And I was like, man, and I just remember. So when I had Mateo, um, I think he was about three months old when I was just struggling and I went to my mom's house to do some laundry and I'll never forget. She looked at me and she said, do you feel like you have no other, no other options? Because I was very self-sufficient. I was very much like, right. You know, and I, I just lost it. And I was like, yeah, like, I feel like I'm stuck. Mm. And you know, that's when she said, well, you can come home. You can. And so that's when. That's awesome. She was always like that. (laughs) Good mama. So that's when, uh, I, uh, I broke up with her. And I just made the decision. I mean, it was kind of like, I just, I have to do what I need to do for me, for my child. And, you know, I, uh, I did my best to maintain relationship with him, with his family, to let him see Mateo. We spent time together. I mean, we still, you know, we're very much connected, you know, probably for the next two, three years ish. Um, okay. you know, I would take Mateo to watch him skateboard at the skate park. So this was like while Mateo was between one three, three months, one and three. Yeah. Did you, when did you move out and move in with your mom? Mateo was three months old. Three months old. Okay. Was Phil there yet? Mm-hmm. All right. We got to yeah. bring that into the story for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we already talked about him okay in my teenage years oh yeah that's right he was already there that's right that's so my stepdad phil um like man mateo opened him up (laughs) like opened up his heart yeah to new levels of love and adoration and the two of them were just like two peas in a pod yeah phil had had a daughter yeah um before marrying your mom Mm -hmm. marlise and so now this was like a son for him right because you were living with him and and man and the the reason why i even brought this up and it reminded me was because of the fact that uh phil our dad has told us so many stories about (laughs) mateo and how that just wrecked his life and how in a good way (laughs) he fell in love with mateo And they became just buddies. And he was Mateo's I mean, I best friend down, and dad and everything all in one. I would come down Grand the stairs dad. in the morning and the two of them would be on the floor playing. Mateo would have his little reader glasses <laughs> with the lenses pull, poked out of it. He would have his fireman jacket and hat on. And they would just be playing. Like, it was just the cutest thing. Yeah. And, you know, he would buy him, like, lightsabers and... And they would play Star Wars and it was just, they really were like buddies. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mateo's our boy. He's now 24 years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, amazing professional rugby player. We're very proud of him. But that was his start with Opie, yeah. as they call him Opie. That is a, a grandfather name in German for mm-hmm. grandfather. Omi and Opie, so that's what um, mom and dad called Chantel's mom Mm -hmm. and dad. became known as Omi and Opie for sure. (laughs) Yeah, and so um, by that time, well, so after I had Mateo, coming back after I had had him, you know, to work again, um, I had the really beautiful opportunity, the same couple who owned the surf shop, um, allowed me to come and work in their home office and I would a- was able to bring Mateo with me so mm-hmm. I would have him in a saucer I could nurse I could you know it was a really beautiful such a gift uh, during that season and then when I actually went back into the surf shop um, I put him in a daycare and and my parents helped me out with that but I worked, uh, so so then they opened up a third shop. We opened up another, a third surf shop in Oceanside. So I was a part of, you know, all of that uh, alongside retail them. Retail again, mm-hmm. right? Well, in a few years in retail then, huh? Mm-hmm. 
And then my mom uh, got a job at the Polinsky Center in San Diego, which is a really large facility for abused and neglected kids. Um, and then from there, she then got a job at a place in Oceanside called uh, Casa de Amparo. And she was like, man, Chantel, you would do amazing here. <laughs> and so, you know, I kind of, at that point, Mateo was, I don't know, two. No, he was one when okay. I was in Casa. Okay. So he was a year old and I just... I was ready for a big girl job. I was like, it was kind of like that transition where, you know, the surf shop was like kid stuff. <laughs> I felt like, and, yeah. uh, and I was ready to kind of step more into something that was a little bit more meaningful, not just retail sales. And um, so I, it was not allowed, but we both got a job at Casa de Amparo. She, because we were <laughs> in two different units, she went to the infants and toddlers unit and I went to the teen unit. Um, we, uh, and man, it's been a long time there. Yeah, that was your first encounter. And obviously you connected, found yourself there for quite yeah, a few years. I definitely, <laughs> I definitely felt like it was a, a purpose. Like I found purpose there beyond, you know, who I was up until that point, right? Um, connecting with the teenagers and just, man, I don't know, being a source for strength and guidance and support. And, you know, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. I really, I really loved it. And um, at the same time, you know, of course it's, it's hard when you're a single mom and, you know, like the goal is to be on your own. I don't want to live in my parents' house forever. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so. Um, How was it with Mateo? Why was it? Was there a connection with Herb or what happened there? And Was he or, or you were pretty much a single parent and mom and dad helped or what was the situation there? How did that end up going? Yeah. So. <laughs> I say this <laughs> not out of anger or bitterness, but out of gratitude. I never had to deal with my kids' dads in court, right? Yeah. No, but I also didn't receive any kind of child support or support thereof. So it was, an, it was a choice that I felt I needed to bank in that sense. Like I, I felt like that was the best route for me. So when things, when it wasn't I wasn't a custody issue then, no, there wasn't any kind of custody issue. Um, it was more of like, he just wasn't growing up. Right. And okay. then I think at one point he, uh, he moved back to his dad's. He was, you know, that he started down a road of like going in and out of prison. At one point he beat somebody up with a skateboard and did like I don't know, two years in prison. So he would, he would write letters. I will say this. Okay. So because of Herb's injury, um, I, and this, this helped me to really process through how to deal with him. I had to see him as handicapped Yeah. Uh, because that's what he was, right? Like, although he looked presented, he learned, relearned how to walk, talk, eat wow. skateboard i mean the, the guy so was, physically there wasn't issues physically there was no issues it was all more on the emotional level so so what i realized was the part of his brain that was missing is his empathy mm. which is a challenge when you have to deal with authority when you have a job it's a challenge when you have to deal with other human beings wow. so he wasn't able to hold a job he wasn't able to you know i mean be a part of any kind of system because you're dealing with human beings and you're dealing with all of those things. So, so it's really heartbreaking when you think about like what that kind of life leads to, right. Then you're also, you know, a mixed uh, race. 
And then once you get picked up for one thing, you get picked up for another and it just comes uh, a cycle. It just became a really big cycle in his life. And yeah, I guess we should mention that because that's a big part of it. He is half black, black right? And mm -hmm. Mateo then a quarter black. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And half German. <laughs> yeah. No. So, Mateo. you know, but I, again, I want to, I want to say this, that while he didn't have emotional capacity for relationship per se, I will say that he did the best he could as long as he could. Um, I would get letters and while they were very repetitive, they were consistent, right? Mm -hmm. So wow. he, you know, and again, even, you know, into Mateo's older years, like he, he did his best for a handicapped yeah. man, really emotionally stunted. I, yeah. I believe that he is just, yeah. you know, super emotionally stunted. So you know, the challenge, the bigger challenge that I had was then dealing with his family and, you know, the dynamics, the are... dynamics is a good <laughs> word. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, well, we can get into that even when we got together, some of those things that came up, but all right. So now Mateo is how old when you met Hazel's father? Yeah. So another African-American, another mm -hmm. black man. Yeah. So, Mateo was about three years old. Okay. Um, and I met D. One of my girlfriends played in a band, and um, he was playing pool, and uh, so we connected. And then, shortly thereafter, I moved into uh an apartment with one of my girlfriends. Um, so it was me, her, and Mateo, and, um, so when I met D, his ex-girlfriend was pregnant, <laughs> and so, uh, in the middle of our relationship, he had a baby, and so, you know, when then, after, you know, I lived with Jenny, we, Mateo and I lived with Jenny for, uh, I think, I don't know, a year or so, something like that before D and I moved in together. Um, and so then we had the baby, um, shared custody with the baby and his name was Javante. And um, so, yeah. you know, the, it was, uh, it was an interesting journey. I was still working at Casa de Amparo um then financially I needed to work more so I then got a job waitressing at the 101 cafe okay. um I think I actually got that job sooner than that anyways um and at the same time uh Javante's mom biological mom was struggling with some things um she was in and out of abusive relationships she had you know, some substance abuse uh, issues. And so D and I then went on a journey of trying to get custody of Javante. So we would get him more and more. And so- um, And how old was Javante and Mateo, their age difference? Three years. Okay. So Mateo's probably yeah. five and, he, and Javante was two during this time when you're- No, Javante was an infant. No, but I mean, I'm asking, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is how long did you guys have Javante? The whole time well so d and i were together for five years okay there we go so then you know and then we split up for a year and then we got back together for another year <laughs> uh, little rocky <laughs> little, little tumultuous and uh, never married <laughs> no no there was there was some um yeah some some chaos there and yeah. uh you know Definitely, uh, but I was committed to the family and, you know, so. Um, so you pretty much raised Javante for about five years then? Yeah. Okay. I see. By that time, Mateo was eight and then you guys, you and D split up. 
Mm -hmm. And then what were you doing work-wise? You were still working at Casa de Amparo, working mm -hmm. with abused and neglected children and, yep. and still... Now, had you moved up to management there? Yeah, so uh, I started there on the teen unit, and um, I loved it. But I also wanted more money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in order yeah. to, so the way that, that it worked is that you had to become a supervisor over the, the children's unit first before you could become the supervisor over the whole thing. And so I just began that journey pretty quickly, actually. Yeah, that <laughs> doesn't surprise me. <laughs> because I was motivated. I wanted to be the supervisor over the whole unit. And I wanted <laughs> to be up where the teens were and then have other staff, you know, run in the... So I did. And um, yeah, those are some good years. We I... You know, I had some some amazing experiences with these kids and, you know, some of them I'm still in touch with, you Absolutely. know, right off the bat, <laughs> uh, our spiritual daughter, Sade, yeah. she was 12 years old and um, I had her there for two and a half years, which is unheard of. It's It was supposed to be a temporary shelter, um, so her stay there was far too long. Um, but the, she then, you know, took my number <laughs> <laughs> illegally, broke the rules, and, and, kept oh, well. in touch. and that was that was the one thing that you know uh, was the biggest challenge in the in the the child care system in the the child protective service system. Right? Is you know you weren't supposed to maintain relationship outside of the. The organization and um, rules and regulations, but it was so tragic for me, and it was definitely something that went against everything in my very core, because these kids, they go through so much. They've been through so much trauma. They've experienced so much neglect, rejection, abandonment. Whether they've just come into the system or they've been in the system, then they've gone in and out of foster homes, rejected by foster parents. You know, you have adoptions that fall through reunification plans that fall through and so it's just like this really horrible cycle and then you have these staff members who are equipped yeah and they really you know build relationship with these kids and we're just supposed to let them go and like you know just well just be on your way and you know yeah. be be another source of abandonment for them right um man it just it it that really tore me up yeah for sure for sure so it was interesting because the whole season that i worked uh in the system then then we started the age of myspace and then social media right so myspace was <laughs> oh, first interesting and i remember you remember that it's no longer around yeah but, i remember wow. <laughs> like they really like tried to control it yeah they tried to control it uh I had, you know, friends who got fired over it because kids would leave the the unit and contact them on my, MySpace and like they would try to monitor it. Like it was a whole thing. And when Facebook came out, it's like they just figured they can't do it anymore. Right. <laughs> so yeah. it kind of the control kind of dissipated in that sense. But I was so grateful for social media for that reason, um, because I have been able to be a part of these kids lives in their adulthood you know some of them have you know repeated their family dynamics some of them have polarized completely and had radical success um you know i've seen it all and uh i've also seen you know the tragic side of of like you know in and out of jail yeah. or you know prostitution all of those things you know i mean there's so much that happens when kids are systematized mm -hmm. and um but i feel like at least with social media they are they still have a connection with yeah. the staff members that they right, connected right. with right? Right, right like i i love it you know when when i see a post from one of the kids that we had in one season and there's like four of us that comment and we're encouraging and you know what I mean? So that is a blessing for me, you know, as far as social media goes. Yeah. And it has been uh, a real side story blessing just 
with Sade and connecting with her and watching her grow up. Mm -hmm. Even myself, obviously, we're like her spiritual parents now and, and uh, still in her life been there when all the kids were born her <laughs> kids call times. us yeah. omi and opi yeah <laughs> so it's really a special um relationship and connection there we love her and love watching that develop and those babies mm -hmm. our babies our mm -hmm. grandbabies so yeah. yeah it's kind of a special story there that started again through the uh the home yeah so it's pretty amazing all right so, so now we but still you know uh as far as uh my relationship with d so again, I said that we broke up for a year and then we got back together for a year. Well, during the year that we got back together, we actually moved to Texas. Um, we moved to Texas for about six months. Okay. And um, it sucked. <laughs> That's crazy. I, I got to ask about this because this girl has been through a lot and you used to like live in apartments that you were working on. He, D was working on. So you... You yeah, made so, it work with Mateo and so um Dante. <laughs> yeah. So D was a a a handyman and aspiring carpenter, right? Yeah. Like he had been trained and taught by a guy. And um so so he was trying to build a business on that 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 end so we ended up moving to austin texas his family was from the houston galveston area and i was really close with his family so i was you know excited to build more relationship with them and um you know again i love adventure so i was i was definitely he loves the the town of austin he really loves that and did mama live there no okay she lived down in in galveston okay so, um, yeah, so when we moved there, you know, initially we stayed uh, in a friend of his apartment until she had to rent it out. And um, so he had gotten a job with a property management company. And, um, you know, because we didn't have a house yet or have a place to live, we um, essentially would go like it was a college town, uh, UT, we would go and um handyman clean out places that you know were evicted or move outs and that's where we slept for the night you know we got a storage unit to hold our stuff and we would pull out you know our sheets and blankets and sleep on the floors of those places wow. and you know during the day he would work and you know do stuff and I had the kids and it was the craziest thing I just remember like thankfully Austin has every neighborhood has a park and they have like a little community pool. And I just remember some of these places going back and laying out our mat and showering the kids and they'd be full of mosquito bites and just lathering them with <laughs> calamine lotion. And it was a really hard season for sure. Um, eventually we did get a place and, <clears throat> you know, this was our second go around and it was, we were hopeful that we could work it out. Right. And, and it just kind of just became harder and harder. And ultimately um, the custody battle with Javante's mom, we ended up having to take Javante back to California. And so we moved back to California. We moved in back into my parents' house, uh, into the garage. <laughs> Interesting yeah and uh that's where i found out i was pregnant with hazel so it wasn't it wasn't long after that that the turmoil and the the chaos that that continued um i think mama bear kicked in again <laughs> yeah. and i was i was i was done there was there was a lot you know things had shifted with you know, how D was interacting with Mateo versus Javante. And, you know, there was, there was just clearly a divide and it was, um, it was time. And so I was pregnant. I think I was maybe two months pregnant with, with Hazel when I was done. And you were also back working at 
thoughts of Dan Parle, right? Yeah, because so I, I remember did. We, yeah. yeah. When I moved back to California, I I went back to Casa, and uh, at that point, I was working full time. Um, up until I had Hazel, and then, unfortunately, I had to go back six weeks later and work part time, and so. Yeah, and then. Uh, about that time after having Hazel, isn't that when you went to work at another restaurant, Broken Yolk? Okay. <laughs> yep. So now she had three jobs. Mama, <laughs> Casa de Amparo, working with abused and neglected kids, and a waitress. Yeah. Yeah, so it was interesting because um, I was I was working real hard during that time. I was saving up to get a car, and, you know, I... Uh, just it was actually a really good season because I was I was pregnant with Hazel I I started like the one thing that I got new for this baby coming was a jogger stroller and I started jogging and jogging up and down the strand and I just I felt good during that pregnancy um she was born in August and I would go lay on the beach and dig a hole or three <laughs> holes and just like lay in the sand i would be in a bikini yeah. like i felt good like it was just a whole different ball game i i i just felt strong and at it that seems point. like was it was it during that time because i'm trying to connect now where we actually met first well I'll, I'll get before we ever had any yeah. kind of relationship so you were doing some personal growth and development during this time mm -hmm. yep network marketing <laughs> learning that well yeah because i was sister. a hustler yeah she was <laughs> <laughs> michelle was doing this Still health is. and wellness <laughs> business um and of course she got everybody involved in it and um so they would have events and whatnot and you know i did meet you and yeah. your previous wife Yep. And, still um, married, actually. It's kind of strange. Yeah. We just met in passing because of her sister, Michelle. Yeah. Again. Was... And then so he and my sister, you know, became good friends. And and so I was just, you know, I was busy working and working and being a mom and um, going after the dream, the dream of being able to just do that kind of job, work from home, right? <laughs> Type of thing, maybe. I, really the ultimate dream for me was to take care of my own kids yeah. you know at that point i had taken care of so many other people's kids yeah and uh it was um it was really hard that became really hard for me to um yeah to have my kids in daycare to you know have other people taking care of my kids while I'm taking care of other people's kids. It, it just became this really like torturous, like thought process. And it was like, man, I would just love one day mm -hmm. to be a mom, a housewife. Like that's all I ever wanted, you know, with D, but like he never could get anything going enough. I had to do so much and, yeah. you know, so that was. So it's kind of interesting. Cause I remember, I think it was, the first time we met was because Michelle introduced us and Lee and I were singing at one of the events. I was I in Utah. Yeah. And and I remember it was snowing or something. I don't know. I just met in passing. I actually hardly remember that at all because it was just like, oh, Michelle's sister. Yeah, I drove. Were you I, pregnant then? No. I you had already kids. had Hazel? Yeah. Okay. She was kids. really small then. She must have been a baby baby because. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been right after she was born. Mm -hmm. And then because. A road trip with the kids. I remember then later on, uh, I came and spoke at an event. And I remember it's really interesting, again, the, the crossing of paths and like when you first notice somebody, I was married. It wasn't anything like that. Like it truly was just one thing I noticed. So it was at this one event. It was in San Diego. I always talk about this because I asked her about it, but I wanted her to share it um, was I was I was there as a leader. And I remember you were was, you were sitting on the front row. And what caught my attention was I remember looking in there as there was a speaker and they were speaking and training and um, and she actually got up and left and she was in tears. And I remember her leaving. That really stood out to me. Then I noticed that she's on the front row. Number one, number two, she's very emotional about something. 
never found out about what that was about till years later <laughs> but uh just it it's one of those things where it's like oh that's michelle's sister i wonder if she's okay you know because i obviously caring about people um so that's when i noticed her mm-hmm. even more so so yeah yeah so that what was that about it was uh they were they were i don't know of course you know pers- uh network marketing they were talking about making enough money to be able to go into a restaurant and just leave a hundred dollar bill for the waitress. Well, here I was, I was a single mom busting my ass left and right. And like, wow, what a, what a blessing that would be. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So it it was pretty cool. Cause I think the emotion, (laughs) the emotion was, I want to be able to do that for somebody like myself. Yeah. That's where the emotion was. You know what I mean? That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Wow. So. And it was several months later when we actually kind of <laughs> met again. It would have been. After yeah. That so, point. you know, well, it was shortly after Utah, actually, where you and, and Lee separated. Yeah. And you went to Arizona and then eventually you went to California. So mm-hmm. at that point, so my journey with D was that again battling this like I don't want to keep him from Hazel I don't want to be I don't want to be that girl who yep. like you know keeps their kids from their dad or whatever but at the same time I was definitely battling like protection and in what was healthy and whatnot and um so there was just a lot of dynamics that weren't healthy. And so, you know, I stair-stepped our communication. Um, You know, I allowed him in the hospital when I was giving birth, you know, him, Javante and Mateo, they were all there and uh, my parents and and one of my best friends. And, um, but then I stayed, I stayed because I also had another surgery at the same time and, and the same bullshit happened and so I had to kick him out of the hospital and so it was like you know it was very it it just got the communication got less and less and then it went to you know no phone calls to just text and it was no text just to emails and then it was like I had a conversation with his mom and I said you know because I was I was very 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 close to his mom um in fact Hazel has her namesake um her name was Patsy Rose and uh, I just had a conversation with her and it was a conversation I was having done work done down in Mexico. And so I had about a 45 minute drive and I was talking to her on the phone and I was just explaining to her where I was at emotionally, where I was at, you know, relationally and, you know, letting her know that I love her. I adore her. I love the family and I have to make this decision. I have to make this decision to cut off all communication. And, you know, her response was really like exactly what I needed in that moment. Her response was, baby, (laughs) you do what you need to do. And she said, when I sit up here and I look at, you know, that was it was at the early stage of the narcissistic movement like oh. she actually said that oh, and i was like oh okay what's that mean <laughs> back then i you know i what i what i needed to hear was that she understood me yeah right she she validated my decision and allowed it it really did bless me and allow me to just kind of release it yeah because um because it was hard you know I mean I fought for so long in this relationship seven years worth with the one you know not being together but of of like like this is my family like I outside you know I didn't necessarily believe in marriage but I would have married him I 100% would have married him I because I'm a committed person and I love relationship I love like dating sucked <laughs> <laughs> I hated dating you know what I mean like I that's just not where I thrive I thrive in relationship and I was I was committed and so for me to just like be able to let that go was 
so huge. Yeah. Um, the ironic thing is that was a drive down to Mexico because I was having dental work and uh, I was meeting my sister because she was the dental technician working alongside a dental, a dentist um, to, you know, do dental care for less. Right. So it was awesome. It was an awesome gig. Um, I show up down there and Chuck <laughs> back then it was chuck you know? chuck is with her in the parking lot and so of course you know we had met before so i was like hey, what are you doing here you know and um i had no idea that he was you know in california or whatever and so uh we all went to mexico um for a dinner. he was just along for the the ride for the day yeah, i was with michelle that's when i was sleeping on michelle's couch and homeless at the time <laughs> So yeah, it was it was pretty cool timing, and Hazel would have been about eighteen months at the time. Mm -hmm. um, Mateo was about 11, 10, 10, yeah, somewhere in there. So yeah, amazing, super grateful for Herb and D their contribution to bring those two to life. Really, it's amazing because yeah, the opportunity I had then to connect with you and, and then connect with those kids was super awesome but before we go there I do want to talk about one more thing before we talk about it, our blend now and connection and that is that today that is maybe <laughs> <laughs> but before we go there I want to uh, talk about mama because uh, I do want to bring in the spiritual side of things mm -hmm. because that's going to be part of our story as we tell it where we combine <laughs> there's some funny so things about Momo, the spiritual stuff. who he's talking about is Dee's mom. Yeah. Patsy Rose. The one who, she was just talking about. Yeah. That she had uh, communicated with and mm -hmm. mama was super awesome. And you stayed in connection with her and, and stayed in connection with, with Hazel and her mm -hmm. um, conversations, phone calls and things like that too. Yeah. So but she lived in Texas. So she then, lived in Texas. So uh, where was your spiritual connection with her at one point? Because I remember, again, I know some of this information asking Chantel when we got together, like where where did your like connection with God, spirituality start? And she really said, hey, hey my spiritual mom was that's where Mama came in. That she, yeah. entered, she told me that's where Ma, who Mama was to her. So yeah. tell us about that. So... Um, the first time that D and I went to Galveston to visit his family, uh, I was super intimidated. Um, D's black. So his whole family <laughs> is a whole brood of black women. So for anybody who understands what that's like, you're like, okay, so I'm the only white chick, <laughs> you know, she's a little pale being German. <laughs> I'm just white. Uh, it's so funny because I, I remember feeling totally like, okay. I gotta, I gotta put, you know, like step into my courage, yeah, put my big girl panties on and, and, uh, we're, we're going to do this. And, <laughs> uh, man, I was so wildly blessed. Mm -hmm. I was so wildly blessed. That family welcomed me with open arms, love, joy. I still adore every single one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I still have great connections with every single one of them. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there's their family. Yeah. They are family. And um, so, you know, of course, his mom, um, I had started having conversations with her ahead of time. So she was, you know, probably the easiest one to meet. Um, but we just really, really, really connected. And so again reminding you that we were battling custody with Javante so we had br brought the kids down to Texas to see the family and um Javante's mom had pulled some stuff and midway through our trip demand the the court demanded that he bring Javante back to California so um the craziest thing that had happened is I had just bought a vehicle so it was still under a dealership warranty. Um, and while we were traveling from his sister's house in Houston to Galveston, the front differential went out. Like oh, wow. it like literally like <clears throat> collapsed on the freeway. Oh dang. Uh yeah. And that was our that was our ride. And so we had this dilemma. The court wants Javante back in California. 
I have this car that's now in the shop yeah. under dealership warranty being fixed. And so Mateo and I stayed with the family, uh, Demetrius and Javante got on a Greyhound bus and headed back to California. Well, simultaneously, <laughs> Hurricane Katrina hit. Okay. So here we are, Mateo and I, <laughs> with this family that we're meeting for the first time and hanging out with for the first time, actually for an extended time now because of the hurricane. Hmm. Um, it was a really profound time. And um, Patsy and I, Mamo, um, just really soaked up each other, I think. Okay. So that was the connection. That, that was the time. connection. Wow. And, you know, that's where Mateo connected really much, a lot with the family. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, they loved us. Like, they just, they made it amazing. You know and, what I mean? And Mama was always about spiritual things and the Bible. Yeah, I would come down and, and, you know, we'd have our coffee and smoke our cigarettes and, <laughs> and uh, look at the word. And yeah. I hadn't looked at a Bible because I, I was a Mormon yeah <laughs> right like I, I mean I didn't have a relationship with the Bible right in the Mormon church it was the scriptures and it was more focused on the book of Mormon yeah. right so it wasn't the Bible was very not looked at in that sense yeah if I you know I, I don't remember <laughs> anything about the bible from my childhood and and being mormon it was all focused on the book of mormon and um but yet they sold them together in scriptures it was weird anyways um i think that was their way of like trying to make it they were still christian or something yeah. like that sure. i don't know sure so anyways uh we would just we would just talk we would talk about like stories and life and the bible stories and life and and just, I don't know, we just had this really incredible time. It was, it was, I would, I would say that it was, it was supernatural. Like we, we kind of were forced just into that, <laughs> that season. And um, I definitely cherished that time with her. So that would have been like your first real experience of even getting into the Bible. Yeah. And, and we went to church with her and it was, wow. you know, the, the, southern black church like everybody wore hats like it was wow. you know full on and yeah. i loved it like i just i'm i'm a very soulful person i love that you know um yeah that's awesome yeah oh. I, that's i think that is a good important thing to talk about here just because she um, mama is definitely part of our story too later on um that we'll share so yeah, I wanted to definitely bring that up. Mm -hmm. And so now um, we're to the point where we connect. Uh, we had met officially probably like in 2010 uh, or, or a little bit earlier than that, maybe. I don't know. I don't remember. But the point is, is by 2010 was actually where it was Mexico, I think. Wasn't it by 2010, somewhere in there? <laughs> maybe the end of 2010. Yeah, it would have been end of 2010. You want to know why I know that? Because I came to I came to California because it was Christmas. Yeah. That's why I didn't want to be. Now you can kind of see where the stories connect. I didn't want to be in um I thought that would be 2009. No, it was around 2010. It was at the end of 2010, or maybe it was No, because Mateo was 10 when you and I got together. Okay. So, so yeah, it would have been 2010. It would have been at the end of 2009 then. Yeah. Because he's he would have turned 10 in January. January. Okay. So there we go. The end of 2009, <laughs> I went to California for Christmas because I wanted to get out of Safford, Arizona, small town, because of Lee and I being separated and going through the divorce. And I know how small towns are. I'm like, I am not going to. I was sleeping on a friend's couch there in, in uh, Safford, Arizona. I did not want to be there for the drama of a small town since we were divorcing and separating. And yeah. So. I went to California. I actually called Michelle and I said, Hey, Michelle, I want to get out of Safford. Can I come sleep on your couch for the holidays? And she said, yes. And so that's then where I came was with Michelle and hanging out with Michelle and Jay 
Uh, and I'm super excited to tell more of that story because they're an intricate part of that. Mm -hmm. And um, and then yeah, Mexico, because I went with Michelle. Now Michelle was doing that thing, the the safe travel to Mexico to get dental work done. And she mm -hmm. was doing those things for people and helping people in that way. And I just went with her, you know, sleeping on her couch and hanging out. And she's like, well, you want to come with me? So I went with her and then lo and behold, Chantel showed up. I was like, oh, Chantel, oh, hey, I remember you. So dun, 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 that's how it began. So there's where we started merging. So now we'll, next we'll get into the story of us coming together and where it started and then how it developed and all the different things of <laughs> blending families. <laughs> so stay tuned, check it out. Yep. Thanks for listening. Maybe that was beautiful. Awesome. Thanks for telling your story. I'm so good. So good. Love you. Love you.